Do you constantly daydream about slaying dragons and marrying demon women as a six foot four bodybuilder He-Man Chad with a sick sword whilst actually being almost the complete opposite of that exact thing? Does music produced by guitarists that are actively speed running themselves towards RSI and arthritis excite you beyond imagination? Do you only enjoy albums if they have fantasy artwork that looks like it was drawn by a seven year old on as cover art? Well, power metal might be the perfect genre for you. And guess what? my goblin avatar is actually applicable to the genre for once, although it'd probably be more fitting if I looked like this. Power metal is a subgenre of heavy metal that actually isn't that extreme, unless you're talking about the extreme delusion felt by many of the fans. Apart from the obvious strange fantasy themes that are present in pretty much all power metal songs, one of the main themes is pure speed. Essentially, imagine the music that would accompany an epic fantasy battle with dragons, goblins, and wizards and shit only double the speed that may just about accommodate the sheer speed this genre can reach. Guitarists and bassists play extremely fast riffs that sound more like you're being sonically abused by a rapid stream of notes than anything that resembles music. And what I just told you is actually a lie disguised as a joke, because power metal focuses heavily on the melodic aspect of the music, with much of the guitar being incredibly catchy in a way that's more Lord of the Rings video game on the PS1 than anything in the pop sphere nowadays. I know I've been jabbering on about speed for about a minute now, but it doesn't actually entirely define the genre. Whilst thrash will focus on rapidly changing chords, power metal oftentimes slows that <laughs> down, really emphasise the melody and emotion behind each of the chords. I would cover bass, but it's literally pointless because you can't <laughs> hear it unless it's just root notes. Well, unless you're... Metal drumming is pretty standard, sounding relatively similar to any other subgenre of heavy metal that employs a similar speed, only they often use a double kick pedal to play kick drums on every 16th note. As power metal is a subgenre that sees its roots in the 80s metal scene, the guitar solo is an extremely important part of the song, with it actually being the part most fans look forward to so they can awkwardly air guitar on the bus whilst receiving dirty looks from anyone over the age of 40 and snickers and cackles from anyone under the age of 20. Solos are complicated and fast paced, although still have a strong emphasis on melody, focusing on creating a sound. Speaking of bands will utilize other instrumentation outside the typical metal formula to make the music sound more grand and orchestral. This can either be literally a full symphonic orchestra, obviously just played on a keyboard by one guy, because apparently the only people in metal that full orchestras will actually work with are these motherfuckers for whatever reason. Keyboard synthesizers are also used either as small background elements or to create full scale melodies that play alongside the guitar. One of the more unique aspects of power metal are the vocals, with most singers completely avoiding this style of singing. She made fucking Instead, they actually sing, I mean like sing cleanly, something that may actually be appreciated by somebody over the age of 70, as opposed to causing irreversible damage to their heart. Although vocalists avoid any sort of guttural or growling styles for the most part, they still have some pretty ridiculous range, although focus more so on this than this. These mother can get high pitched. This is when we get onto the bread and butter, meat and potatoes, the lyrical themes within power metal. Essentially imagine everything that actually exists and has relevance to the world, such as politics or religion. Then imagine the complete opposite, because power metal lyricism rarely delves into these themes. Instead, they focus on fantasy, mythology, personal struggles, war and death. However, the last three are only used if the war involved creatures that only bleed purple blood or some shit like that. Unfortunately, once again, I've told another lie in the veil of a joke, as many power metal bands actually focus their lyricism in real warfare from the past, although they mainly focus on wars that have been butchered by modern fantasy, such as Vikings and Samurais. Lyrics can delve into a wide range of different topics, but they all hold a common trait. They are all topics enjoyed by this mother <laughs> who hasn't missed a Marvel Midnight release in 14 years. So how did this happen? Why on earth has a genre developed that appeals to people that parents tell their children to avoid whilst they buy Pokemon cards at the local game shop? Well, this is actually a difficult question to definitively answer, as there has been a long heated debate on who actually invented the genre, primarily due to the fact that it isn't distinct enough from similar genres, and also due to the fact that nobody really cares enough to look into it. You can definitely make an argument that Dio alongside Rainbow would inspire elements of eventual power metal, mainly with lyricism that concentrated on medieval, renaissance and science fiction themes. Despite this, realistically power metal saw rumblings when metal really started to to take off around a decade after Ozzy Osbourne braced us with his presence. Do you know what it means when someone says based? 
Bitch. No, based. Bitch. This metal scene would be known as New Wave British Heavy Metal, which is a name so stupidly long, it's the only thing putting me off covering it in a video. Much like Dio beforehand, bands like Iron Maiden and Judas Priest utilised clean, high-pitched vocals, a focus on speed, and fantasy lyricism in some cases. The frontmen within these bands would also inspire what would eventually become power metal by being as ridiculously theatrical as possible. So around this time, speed metal was running rampant, and there were only two paths this genre could go, and it's development, one of which being thrash metal and the other being the equally goofy power metal. But who actually definitively started the genre? Many consider Germany's Halloween to be the first official power metal band, and they definitely were the first to embrace the moniker. Despite this, I believe many bands beforehand were essentially power metal before a label was slapped upon the genre. Bands like Sabotage and Running Wild were essentially just power metal and would utilise ideas that would go on to influence the genre in the coming years. But let's be honest, these guys are not oiled up enough. Surely the pioneers of power metal would look like an oiled up He-Man cosplayer, and luckily they actually did, Man of War. Despite the fact Man of War's early sound was slightly different from many of the power metal bands after, their ability to be so ridiculously goofy allowed power metal to exist. They would dress up in scantily clad leather clothing, oil themselves the f**k up, and cosplay as a group of cavemen that had just discovered metal, music, and anabolic steroids. Despite Man of War potentially being the most American thing imaginable, early power metal was primarily a European feat. Europeans are for the most part more connected to their medieval and fantasy roots, because their countries actually have experienced some history, unlike America, who pretend they have deep history by gorging themselves with estrogen filled food and blowing it up a few times a year. This brings us back to Halloween, who would release Keeper of the Seven Keys Part 1 in 1987, building a deep lore and narrative and attaching it to the record. This would inspire the fantasy world building themes that are seen in pretty much every power metal project. Musically, this project would take speed metal and put further emphasis on the sheer speed. This started a rat race with similar bands, continuously speeding up the music. Running Wild can also be considered an important band within the early scene, specifically with their conceptual elements. They would essentially just pretend to be pirates. Halloween and Running Wild would also be joined by bands like Hammerfall, Stratovarius and Nightwish, who would also focus on the speed and fantasy elements of the music, oftentimes dressing in some of the least flattering outfits imaginable on stage. This this scene wouldn't gain as much popularity or cultural relevance than for example the adjacent thrash metal, although it would become incredibly appealing to individuals who are already interested in dressing up in medieval robes and swinging around foam swords, as they finally had music that could accompany their epic fantasy adventures that only took place in their own head when the McDonald's they worked at was particularly quiet. Whilst we're on the topic of McDonald's, this European scene would go on to inspire a few bands in America, Camelot and Ice Earth. The latter has a founding member that actually stormed the capital, and I suppose you could consider that a side quest, so I guess it's on brand. These bands in the US would employ a slower tempo with darker themes, which is strange for America, because they usually make things as bright and over the top as possible. Unfortunately, Americans weren't powerful enough for power metal, and much of the genre-defining records would quickly return to Europe, specifically Finland in the case of Sonata Artica's debut, Ecliptica. The metaphorical themes alongside catchy melodies would catch the attention of grease heads around the world, influencing a sort of power metal boom in the early 2000s. Power metal bands would dress up as pirates, make music specifically about werewolves and only werewolves, have two people play one guitar for some reason, and perhaps most surprisingly, actually have an awareness of real history as opposed to fake fantasy warfare. As metal genres usually do, power metal has laid the groundworks for many other subgenres within the metal sphere. Bands like Elven King and Wuthering Heights would introduce folk elements into the music, which makes perfect sense, I'm not gonna lie. Symphony X would add some progressive elements into the mix, pushing the sound into new directions, and some bands such as Children of Bodom would intensify the sound adding more aggression, which can be seen as a kind of early form of melodic death metal. Although power metal has never reached the heights of popularity as genres such as thrash or death metal, it surprisingly managed to keep itself consistent within the underground, perhaps even more so than those previously mentioned genres. I think it has a lot to do with its particular appeal. Sweaty, long-haired men in costumes dancing on stage while screaming about fantasy worlds is never going to be universally appealing or even be considered cool in any way, but the people it does appeal to are going to latch onto it and become die-hard supporters. Power Metal manages to avoid the common trope of metal artists trying their hardest to be as serious as possible whilst playing perhaps the goofiest genre in existence. Power Metal just says f**k it and embraces every stupid element of the genre, creating music that may lack quality or depth in some places, but manages to replace that with just sheer fun. And if I'm being
being honest, power metal concerts seem extremely enjoyable, although I would never attend one due to the sheer stench and the fact that I physically recoil upon seeing Marvel t-shirts or the average Funko Pop consumer. <laughs> 